It is my uh, uh, extreme joy to uh, be able to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, a friend, a co-conspirator uh, in the person of Joel Carpenter, our uh, uh, journey uh, has been a long while uh, now, uh, but before I come to that, let me uh, just say that Joel Carpenter is the director of the Nagel Institute for the Study of World Christianity at Calvin College. Uh, he has been in this role at that college for 11 years. Uh, for uh, 10 years prior to that uh, role at Calvin College, he was the provost there. Uh, and prior to that, um, his word is tour of duty. Uh, and all of us who have been in administration in various places I really like that word, tour of duty. Before that tour of duty at uh, Calvin, two-sided tour of duty at Calvin, he was the director of the religion program at the Pew Charitable Trust. And um, uh, our uh, journey uh, together uh, began really in earnest when he was at the Pew Charitable Trust. And uh, under his openness to world Christianity, the Pew Charitable Trust uh, uh, had uh, made grants uh, beyond, beyond Pennsylvania, beyond the US, beyond, beyond, and particularly to places like Africa. And uh, indeed, uh, we worked together uh, in the, what was then the Africa Theological Initiative that uh, 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 was a very helpful thing for, for Africa. So, but. Joel is a historian by profession. Degrees from Calvin College, Johns Hopkins University. He taught for 12 years at Calvin. He taught also at Trinity. Uh, he taught at Trinity. Uh, 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 from 78 to 83. He's a young man, but he taught here uh, when he was only 12. <laughs> and taught at Wheaton College. At Wheaton, he was the director of the Institute for the Study of American Evangelicals. I think that the first time I actually met you, Joel, was at a conference in 1989 uh, in conjunction with um, uh, the ISAE at uh, Wheaton. So that's, uh, that's how far back we go, uh, 1989. Dr. Carpenter has published extensively in the field of American religious history. He's uh, uh, published uh, a book that is award-winning that I actually own and have read, Revive Us Again, The Reawakening of American Fundamentalism at Oxford University Press in 1997. I commend that book to everyone. Uh, but he's published uh, in other er er fields as well, three edited books, Walking Together, uh, Christian Thinking in Public Life in South Africa in 2012, Christian Higher Education, a Global Re Reconnaissance in 2014, Edmonds. Uh, Christianity in Chinese Public Life and Religious Society, The Rule of Law, Palgrave Macmillan, 2014. Currently co-editing uh, a book on Christianity in India with Rebecca and Samuel Shah. And um, uh, our uh, current working together has taken us to uh, Abidjan Cote d'Ivoire, um, but 10 days ago, and uh, Harold Netland was there, uh, where uh, we have been uh, guiding a major research grants uh, initiative for 23 teams of African theologians and social scientists funded by the John Templeton Foundation. That's, uh, so I'm grateful that uh, even though we are both jet lagged, that Joel, you are here this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say to you uh, from uh, your heart, and then, then we'll talk to you after. Okay, so. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Teet. I wondered if, uh, if you have a copy, you could send that to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I called her this morning and she said she'd be praying for me, so I feel well fortified for, for this event. Um, dear friends and colleagues here at Trinity, I'm so honored to be here uh, speaking to you today on this fine occasion. Um, you know, there's a, a growing number of centers and institutes um, all aimed at a uh, better understanding of world Christianity and also in saying uh, how, in fact, do um, institutions, especially Christian institutions of learning in the global north, um, make sense of this amazing phenomenon of our, of our time? And also, what does it mean? How is, this, how is this changing who we are and how we think and how we witness? And it's great to, to welcome uh, Trinity uh, to that, to that uh, what shall we say, confraternity, right? So uh, Boston U has a center. Um, uh, Gordon Conwell has a center. Of course, the, the famous uh, center in many respects, kind of the, the mothership for many of us at, at the New College Edinburgh. And the Overseas Ministry Study Center, uh, also venerable and, 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 and strong. Uh, in this field in New Haven. Uh, Fuller has a center, I think also in global theology. Asbury has a center in, in uh, revival and renewal in the Christian world today. Nagel Institute, um, and we, we do interdisciplinary work at Nagel. We, do, uh, we help theologians, we help philosophers, we get helped uh, by artists. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, a center fitting for a, an arts and sciences uh, Christian institution like Calvin College. But uh, I, I really uh, you know, appreciate your uh, desire to focus intently on theology per se. Of course, that's what you do here, right? Uh, um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's welcome, and I do hope that uh, uh, the next time these various uh, center directors get together that we'll be able to uh, compare notes. And uh, you know, I wish you every strength as you go forward in whatever endeavors the, the Lord brings your way. It's a, it's a field full of surprises, and maybe you have some ideas about what will be the first things out of the chute here, but uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, um, uh, as Andrew Walls would say, more power to your right elbow. <laughs> um, uh, I'm so glad to be back at Trinity, this institution that gave me a chance as a young assistant professor uh, some 35, even 40 years, nearly 40 years ago. I taught history for five years at Trinity College, and Janice and I have some warm memories of our sojourn here and uh, the depth of community we enjoyed. The college is very small and seat of the pant play, pants place uh, back then. And of necessity, it generated some really wonderful interdisciplinary learning and fellowship among us profs. And, uh, and it required real resourcefulness from us and find ways to serve our students. And we had, we had splendid leadership. I really love working for our deans, for Ed Hakes and for Bob Baptista. They were both emigres from Wheaton, uh, who wanted to do something more interesting. And, <laughs> They uh, were outstanding faculty recruiters, at least I thought so, and, uh, <laughs> and they gave sacrificially of their time and budgets for our development as teachers and scholars. It was a wonderful place to start as a Christian scholar and teacher. Um, but more direct to our purposes today, it's a privilege to honor uh, Dr. Tianu as the founding director of this new center. And as Tita's has already said, we go back quite a way too, and we are collaborators yet again. It's kind of like, you know, the Western where the old, the old gunslingers, <laughs> you, know, try, you know, get back in the saddle. And, and uh, so here, here we go. Collaborators again on behalf of African Christian theology. Um, I want to recognize the long, I'm a historian, so you know, the way I approach anything is how did we get here? Where did this come from, right? I want to recognize the long time efforts of Trinity to make the church's world mission an integral component of its research and teaching. I didn't know Dr. Hebert, but I've uh, been privileged to be acquainted with many of the great professors of world missions here through the years. 
uh, Will Norton of late, uh, Herb and Winnie Kane, David Hesselgrave, Ted Ward, uh, Lois McKinney Douglas, uh, Jim Pluteman, and most recently, Harold Netland. Um, the original premise for this division's work at Trinity was, of course, to prepare North American Christian agents to go out as missionaries to the rest of the world. But increasingly, these faculty members, and all of you really, I think, here at TEDS, found that a major part of your job has been to teach advanced students from Africa and Asia and Latin America and the Middle East and Eastern Europe who are um, the rising spiritual and intellectual leaders of Christian movements in those places and increasingly um, of the Christian world more broadly. Among the most memorable encounters I had while at Trinity were with African students coming to TEDS and some of them needed to take a couple of undergrad courses, so I had them sitting in my history classes. And um, far beyond what I understood at the time, meeting them um, was the beginning of a major change in my own calling as a scholar and as a promoter of Christian scholarship. Um, what I understood at the time uh, was that these very deferential and polite students who called me sir in the classroom had already accomplished more in their ministry than I could ever hope or imagine. And they had depths of piety and discernment that were awe-inspiring. And I thought, what's going on here? I need to know more. Um, who would have thought um, uh, that, uh, um, oh, there's these double-sided pages, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, who would have thought at that time, circa 1980, that TEDS would eventually install um, one such African apostle as its dean? You know, when I, when I saw that this had happened at TEDS and this, this wonderful uh, portrait uh, of uh, Très Formidable, uh, 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 Professor Tienu, uh, in the pages of Christianity Today magazine, I knew Teet and I knew TEDS and I said, God is full of surprises. <laughs> so anyway, and so it has gone here at TEDS. Um, so now on to this new center. TEDS is, I believe, now opening up a new chapter in its approach to Christianity's world mission. TEDS began with this tight focus on world mission sending and then began engaging more broadly with world Christianity and now Ted seeks to engage specifically with world Christian theology. It's a wonderful thing. Um, I'm particularly intrigued with the third aim of this new center. I don't know if you've seen its aims and purposes, but the, the third aim is, and I quote, to provide guidance for the Ted's learning community in developing a deeper understanding of 21st century global realities and their implications for theological education. Now this is uh, potentially a very bold, even a radical move for a US-based divinity school. Not very many across the entire ATS, Association of Theological Schools, not very many have tried to reshape their theological and pastoral agenda in light of the rise of world Christianity. So I want to encourage you as you take up that challenge. That's a big challenge. It's a radical move to be making. This challenge has come our way too at Calvin College and Calvin Theological Seminary. I recall one very striking instance of it about a decade ago. In July of 2007, the Ghanaian theologians Kwame and Jillian Bediako were at Calvin College to convene an international team of Christian scholars to study Christianity's relationship to primal religions. Uh, we asked Kwame to give a lecture to the Calvin community and he chose to address this question. What were the implications that theologians, especially from Europe and North America, what, what uh, should they be drawing? What implications from the emergence of world Christianity? And quite bluntly, he said, they should be remaking their theology. Christianity, he said, is a religious faith that has been universal in principle from its origins, 
and now is universal in history as well. Christianity no long, could no longer assume to be the religion of the West, he said. Instead, uh, to be more, it should be more accurately understood as a non-Western religion, a truly world faith present on all continents and in virtually all countries. Betty Ocko went on to rehearse what is now a quite familiar story to those who've read his work and read that of uh, the Scottish uh, church historian Andrew Walls. Christian history, they say, has a serial quality to it. Um, it's, um, it, it hasn't uh, like started in one place and spread out from there across the globe in, uh, in sort of contiguous territorial fashion as has Islam. It's, it's, it's gone to places all over the globe, but it's, it's, it's risen and it's declined. And uh, um, where there's a, a decline in adherence and vitality in one region of the world, um, in God's grace, there's an ascend ascendancy in another region. Now, one important implication emerging from this pattern in church history, Betty Ako said, was that in each case, the faith is rescued from circumstances that might doom it were there not some opportunity for it to become rooted elsewhere. Just think if Christianity had only been rooted in the Middle East, it would have died probably with the rise of Islam. But he said, no, no, it, 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 it may be under extreme pressure and decline in some places, but it, it grows in others. And he wanted to focus on the most recent case, he said, uh, it's a rapid decline of Christian vitality in Western Europe and it, its corresponding rapid growth and extraordinary vigor in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Because of this shift, Christianity's vitality in the immediate future no longer seems so threatened by the secularized cultural environment of the modern West, Bediako said. He says, this is a milieu that, and he quoted here a German theologian, Karl Rahner, it's a milieu that has become unchristian and is in the need of re-evangelization. Now, uh, Christianity's future is not, the blunt truth is about Christianity's future. As Professor Tianu once said, and I quote him, the future of Christianity no longer depends on developments in the North. But back to Betty Ako. He was not finished with us in this talk at Calvin. He said, Christian intellectuals in the North Atlantic region might be tempted to say, oh, great, Christianity is going to be saved. And uh, then just to continue with their characteristic modes of thought and witness where they are, comforted by the fact that God's church may be declining up here, but by God's grace, it's building a future somewhere else. No, that's not what should be happening. Uh, these turns of redemption history with fresh translations of the gospel into new cultural terms at each turn are privileged moments, he said. He said they're privileged for understanding the meanings inherent in the faith. The gospel reaches new people, plants itself in new cultures. We understand a different facet of the gospel gem. Um, and redemption history takes a new chapter. We learn more about the gospel. Um, so there was plenty for Western Christian intellectuals to learn, he said, from the rise of Christian faith, practice, and cultural engagement in new contexts. So not off the hook, new things to learn. For years now, Andrew Walls and Kwame Bediako and others have been saying that if the Church of Jesus Christ is now predominantly non-Western, and if the future of the faith is no longer dependent on what happens in the North Atlantic region, then that changes everything. Walls insists that it is Africans and Asians and Latin Americans who will be the representative Christians, who represent the Christian norm, the Christian mainstream, of the 21st and 22nd centuries. Christian thinking, including the most primary and primal such intellectual work, uh, theology itself, will need to remake its categories and its questions. Around the Christian divinity schools and universities in North America, I see signs of eagerness um, to learn more about world Christianity 
textbooks to introduce students to world Christianity are rolling off the trade and university presses. Studies of non-Western Christian movements multiply. Even the Nagel Institute's gotten in that game. We sponsor a series, Studies in World Christianity, with Baylor University Press. Um, edited anthologies of non-Western theology are growing in number two. But if you peruse, uh, you think about the kinds of learned Christian conversations here in theology or in the humanities or in the social sciences, uh, uh, what you see uh, is uh, too often that world Christianity comes into the conversation as sort of a novelty piece. You know, it's uh, something for filling uh, new topical shelves in the library. Uh, to put it another way, uh, in the Western supermarket, theological supermarket of ideas, these collections resemble the ethnic foods aisle. They're safely to the side of the main departments, you know, where the standard meat and produce and bakery and dairy categories of theology in the West still reign. But what we need, Betty Aka was saying, is a reordering of the entire store. Now, unfortunately, there are some reasons to worry about Christian theologians' interests and uptake. Uh, regarding the implications of Christianity's new locations and new centers of vitality. Uh, achieving your new center's third aim, I'm willing to predict, is going to be a bit of a struggle. Perhaps the most important of these concerns is driven by context, where theology in the West has been situated. To us historians, um, everything is contextual. Everything is situated. Uh, we're fascinated with how ideas develop, but we don't study them as purely intellectual dialectic. Ideas arise out of situations. Theology works with universal truths, but it does not ask and answer its own questions. At its very basic level, theology seeks to answer questions that arise when Christian people engage their cultures with the gospel. They seek answers from the scriptures and from wise Christian uh, teaching, past and present, regarding how to give witness and how to live for Christ. As Andrew Walls puts it, Christian scholarship follows Christian mission and derives from Christian mission. Walls frequently narrates his way through many centuries of church history to show this and to show repeatedly that, and I quote him, a lively concern for Christian living and Christian witness has repeatedly called scholarly activity into existence. Um, when Western Christian intellectuals hear contextual theology, however, we tend to think of someone else's context, of attempts in Africa, Asia, and Latin America to express theological ideas in local idioms and to address local concerns. But this is what has happened in the West as well. One of our main problems, therefore, is we do not see Western theology as contextual, but rather as central and universally normative. Once there were, um, someday when there are standard seminary courses on Western theology, as Kwame Badiako used to joke, then we will know that the necessary shift has happened. <laughs> Think with me briefly about this. There is, of course, a Western context. Um, Western theologians began with a creative interaction with Hellenic thought and culture, and for a time they engaged uh, the laws and the customs of the pagan north, uh, but they have operated for centuries since then in the West within the systems and assumptions of Christendom, the official Christian territory of Europe, and then the European settlements overseas. Thus, Western theologians have worked for more than a millennium in situation of religious monopoly. They have not been forced to consider rival religious claims or to engage the contending views of sacred texts other than their own. What has been their chief rival, their significant other, their debating partner? It's been the critical rationality of the philosophers. First off, the pagan Greeks, and more recently, the post-Enlightenment skeptics. Theology in the West often acts as if its greatest mission is to answer the questions 
of those whom Schleiermacher called the cultured despisers of religion. That's, that's the debating partner. And it's a significant one. I don't want to, I don't want to belittle that, but that's, that's been the Western theological context. Uh, in sum, uh, what we now tend to view as a universal outlook of the secular academy is in fact, Andrew Walls argues, a highly indigenized, highly contextual, and historically forgetful view of reality. The Western intellectual and academic edifice is a great fortress of post-enlightenment, post-Christian rationalism and naturalism. It's been laid siege by the postmodernists, but they too uh, work with naturalistic assumptions. And despite uh, the burgeoning academic industry in our universities of studying non-Western cultures, Walls su suggests that the Western Academy's approach to the rest of the world really doesn't represent a world standard, but in fact betrays what he calls the pre-Columbian maps of the intellectual universe. Western Christian scholars struggling to work faithfully within this realm of focus on the challenges of post-enlightenment secularity with strategies that are highly contextualized to our North Atlantic region's situation. So that's been our context. Um, but you know, even that context is rapidly changing, my friends. Not only has Christianity's place and role in the world shifted dramatically, but the world is shrinking, making us all more deeply interactive than ever before. And we who live in the North Atlantic quadrant are now on the receiving end of the greatest migration of people in the history of the world. Both North America and Europe receive millions of new migrants every year from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And while much of Western public concern about this historic migration is focused on Islam, about nearly 60% of the people now entering Western Europe are Christian. And three quarters of all the immigrants in the United States are Christian. The rest of the world is coming our way, and so is world Christianity. Its adherents and its longtime neighbors in religiously plural situations are now settling in with us here in the North Atlantic region. Our new neighbors see the world differently, raise different questions about religious belief and practice. So our theological mission and strategies need to change. And you know, I look around the room and think, I am preaching to the choir. <laughs> I am looking at, uh, looking at students from all over the world here at TED's and thinking, okay, so um, you're here to learn uh, the theological categories from the profs here, but um, we need to hear uh, what are the gospel and culture questions that you've been reckoning with, that you've been trying to apply uh, the word of God and uh, the Christian wisdom of the ages to in your contexts. Our theological mission and strategies uh, uh, here in, in the West, the North, whatever you want to say, um, they need to change. And once again, I'm not, I get to duck out now because I'm not a theologian. It would seem presumptuous for me to forge ahead and here and tell you all the ways in which I think that world Christianity might be pushing you to adjust your categories and methods and assumptions and aims and theology. I had the nerve to try that uh, in another venue, and I'll give you uh, the reference if you want to look it up, but let uh, this much su suffice for now. This is, this is uh, it says lecture up there. These are remarks at, at a lovely occasion. Um, th uh, the rise of world Christianity and the coming in major force of every kind of Christianity to our shores here in the USA will increasingly push us, push us to think differently theologically, uh, to pose different theological problems. The main reason is because our pastoral and missional context is changing. Uh, it's changing rapidly and dramatically. And even the current administration in Washington will not prevail against it. This is a historic um, movement of people we're dealing with. It's like King Canute trying to tell the tides not to come in. If indeed the best theology is mission theology, 
If, it's, if uh, theology is, in fact, a critical reflection on the church's work in the light of the word of God, uh, then our rapidly changing situation will demand changes in our approach. And we will very much need the hard-won perspectives of Christian theologians from around the rest of the world. So in conclusion, uh, Trinity is being farsighted and forward-looking to launch the Paul Hebert Center for Global Theology. And to put a brilliant African theologian, uh, Dr. Tianu, someone who knows life uh, here very well too, in charge. I see a providential trajectory in Trinity's history from Norton to Nedland uh, over the years towards these aims. And I praise our Lord for leading you in this way. More power to you, Teet, and to all you colleagues um, as you launch out in this new venture.